Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I'm Carl Grossman in our studios in New York, speaking to Carolyn Raffensperger. She is the founding executive director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. She's out at the 15th annual Bioneers Conference in San Rafael, California. How are you, Carolyn? Hi. Carolyn, can you tell us about the network? Well, it comes from the really interesting place that the environmental community was at um, early in the 90s. And essentially what had happened is that the environmental community was um, experiencing a real crackdown on environmental regulation. And we were, we were stuck in some ways around how risk assessment and science was being used to either thwart environmental regulation or um, really try to subvert protecting public health and the environment. And so a wonderful group of environmentalists convened in Washington, D.C. to start discussing how they could use science. Um, part of what had happened is that the New York Times had a series of articles writing about dioxin. And the writer at the time started doing really silly things like comparing dioxin to sunbathing and essentially saying these toxic chemicals were, were just kind of piffle bother. They weren't really something that was, uh, that were damaging our health. And so these environmentalists got together and said, we've done great things around um, our, you know, the Sierra Club calendars or the Paul Winter Consort, but we hadn't done the kind of work, the hard work we needed to do around science. And so I was hired to think about these problems and find a way of addressing the ethical dimensions of the environmental protection, um, the whole sphere of protecting the environment, and how we could use science wisely and well. So um, this group of environmentalists, including people like Peter Montague, the Environmental Defense Fund, and uh, Lois Gibbs of Love Canal fame, all got together and um, hired me. And that was 10 years ago. And when you see this program, it will be 10 years, um, almost to the day, that I began this job. So that's the, the origin of this little network. We have a few employees scattered around the country. We function as a virtual network. I'm really using the power of the internet and other things to stay connected and to function as a think tank, a service to the environmental movement. So that's how we came about and that's what we do. A main theme of, of yours, Carolyn, and the network is the precautionary principle. Can you describe the precautionary principle also speak about how the United States has been doing in establishing the precautionary principle here. Well, the United States is uh, not quite a monolithic uh, feature. And in fact, the United States government, the federal government, has been thwarting this idea called the precautionary principle. And uh, just as a, an example, a uh, person in the White House called this idea, uh, which essentially comes down to better safe than sorry. Um, and he said that idea was mythical, like a unicorn or something like that. But the idea of the precautionary principle grew out of the clear signs that were emerging in the 80s and the 90s that we couldn't prove cause and effect for a whole lot of things that were happening in the world. And so um, some years ago in Germany, they began looking at the damage of the, of the Black Forest and they said, we really need to approach this differently. And they were concerned about what acid rain was doing. So they came out with an idea that essentially was a philosophical idea. And it said, we need to use something called for caring. There isn't even a word in English for that. And so for caring um, translated into English, the, the German word that means for caring, was translated as the precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle has now been written into numerous treaties. And essentially it says, in the face of scientific uncertainty and the likelihood of harm, take precautionary action. Now that's all it is. And somehow that's pretty threatening to the powers that be, or at least on the federal level. And we wanted to know how to put that into play. What could we do to make that idea something vibrant and alive? 
And many of you know the story of tobacco in the United States. And what you might not know is that in 1945, beginning in 1945, we had marvelous science that uh, really evolved over nine years. From 1945 to 1954, we got all sorts of case control studies. We got rodent studies, you know, the, uh, looking at how tobacco causes cancer. But we knew, we, we, we had really good information that tobacco is linked to cancer. And we have a whole uh, protocol for proving causation uh, for something like cancer in epidemiological literature, but we were missing one fact. We didn't know how tobacco caused cancer. So between 1954 and 1990, even though we had all of that science, we knew that, that um, if you smoke, the more you smoke, the more likely it is that you get cancer. We had all sorts of information about it, but we didn't know how. And so those tobacco executives could sit there in front of Congress with a straight face and say, we don't believe that tobacco causes cancer. And the reason they could do that is because we were missing one scientific fact. And that's the situation we're in now in this world. We live in a chemical soup. Um, we are facing all sorts of problems. And if we wait for certainty, we are going to wait for dead bodies to pile up and then we'll go, whoops, we should have taken action sooner. The precautionary principle says we take action before the harm to prevent it. That's a very different approach than the way that we're doing things in the United States today. In the United States today, we have a philosophy that says, let's measure things and keep on measuring things and finer tune it and, and, and really get it exact and then we can manage the risk. And what we're doing is we're damaging our children's brains. We are losing the fish in the oceans. We are completely degrading the earth that we live in based on this measuring and managing risk philosophy. And the precautionary principle says we don't have to do it that way. We can do things in an entirely different manner. So I laid out the three basic uh, foundational elements of the precautionary principle, uncertainty, harm, and precautionary action. And people who hear that uh, and oppose the precautionary principle will say things like, oh, you want to stop all progress. You, you just want to go back to the cave days. And uh, somebody who opposed the precautionary principle said, you know, if we'd had the precautionary principle, we wouldn't even have fire. On the contrary, the precautionary principle requires action. It requires us to take the kinds of actions that we need to prevent harm. So how do we go about that? That's a nice um, abstract idea. What would it mean to somebody sitting in an office who really wants to um, come up with some regulations that would prevent harm? Uh, and to use the precautionary principle in a legislation or regulation or even in the courts. How would we do that? Well, there are four ways to do that, four elements for implementing this um, idea of the precautionary principle. The first is we need to set goals. What kind of world do we want to live in? We can look at the rates of asthma or uh, learning disabilities in our schools and we can say, are any of these preventable? And then we can begin to set our goals. If you know what the asthma rate is in your community, and it's pretty easy to find out, you can use different parameters, how many emergency room visits are there or how many inhalers are used. And then we can set our goals. We can begin to reduce those numbers and have a goal where children are born in a world where they're not contaminated with toxic chemicals. Right now we know that every child that's born in the United States comes into the world full of chemicals um, that shouldn't be in their bodies. So we need to set the goals. The second thing that we need to do is begin to look for safer alternatives. And this is, this is part of that action component of the precautionary principle. There are amazing things going on now in the world around green chemistry and green engineering and ideas like biomimicry. How does nature uh, develop uh, all sorts of uh, self-cleaning mechanisms, for instance, for, for pipes and sewage plants? How does nature do that? So Janine Benyus's work in biomimicry or Paul Anastas's work in green chemistry says we don't have to fill the world with toxic chemicals. We can do this in a new way. So let's start choosing them. So for the precautionary principle, we can look at the kinds of harmful technologies or activities and we can look for alternatives to those and put them into play. Thank you, Carolyn, for your work, and thank you for being with us on Enviro Close-Up. For a copy of this or any 
Enviro close-up program, just visit our website at envirovideo.com.